Welcome to Real Life Mentoring, where we explore real life issues to help you make an authentic difference in the world. Well, hi, it's Chris and Christina, and today we have a special guest, Nate Brewer, and I'm going to give the official introduction, Nate, of you. Mm -hmm. I love in your bio, you call yourself a spiritual entrepreneur. You're the author of The Pulse of Christ, a five-fold training manual. You're motivated to live life to the fullest. You enjoy waterfalls. I did not know about this. I don't know what that means. I know. Mexican food. (laughs) And I think, bless your heart, you're in a place you don't get a lot. Soccer, exploring new countries, and your new family live in Austria. We're going to give how people can uh, contact you and see more information about the fivefold training, your website. Um, in the transcript, it'll be available to people. So that's the official. You introduce yourself, and what is your favorite Mexican food item? That is a very important question. I'm glad we're starting <laughs> off with the most important questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to be with you, Chris and Christina, and hello to everyone listening. Pleasure to be on the podcast being interviewed. My favorite Mexican food would probably be fajitas, steak fajitas. Okay. There's a lot of good stuff out there, but if I had to choose one, like sometimes my birthday dinners, those are steak fajitas. Okay. Okay, but you live in Vienna, Austria, and that's where we, we met you years ago. Can you get those there? It's pretty hard. You know, you have to go on like a dark street corner and exchange some <laughs> goods um, to get the goods, but it is possible. And in fact, in the last five, six years, there has been um, somewhat of a, a revival of Mexican restaurants opening here. Okay. I can't say they're necessarily um, authentic, but there's some food here that describes itself as Mexican. <laughs> it describes itself. So we won't go into the uh, dark side of black market fajitas. Let's jump into why we're here today. You wrote a book, The Pulse of Christ, a five-fold training manual. Tell us why you wrote this book. That is a great question. It's interesting because it was never a plan of mine to write a book. It was never a dream when I was young to be a published author. But as many of you know, God has often other plans for our lives than we expect. and so. I, starting with the title, The the Pulse of Christ, Bible Training Manual, um, the word pulse, I mean, when you think of pulse, you immediately think of your body, you think of the um, blood and the pulse pumping through your vein, it's a measurement of of life. It's a measurement that your your body is functioning and it's alive. And when your pulse pumps faster, it means you're excited or you're working out. And so you feel energized. And so I wanted to title it The Pulse of Christ because When we are serving others in our sweet spot, in other words, in our calling, when we found out or discovered what we are made to do and and the purpose of why we exist, we come alive, we blossom, and uh, our, our pulse, our physical pulse does quicken, but especially our spiritual pulse quickens, and we feel like we're alive. You mentioned at the beginning, um, I love to, or, or my life motto is life to the fullest, based on John 10, 10, where Jesus promises life to the fullest. And I I think a big part of that is discovering our sweet spot, what we're made to do, what our calling is. So I wanted to write a book where where the pulse of Christ can pump through our veins. And to get to that second term, fivefold training, that refers, we'll probably get into this a bit more later, but this refers to uh, Ephesians 4.11, refers to five gifts that Jesus says he gave to his body, teachers, shepherds, evangelists, prophets, and apostles. And in each one of us is one of those five or is gifted in one of those areas. So it's about discovering these gifts, which one we are gifted in primarily or secondarily. And it's a practical training manual. That's why I titled it a five-fold training manual, because I wrote the book to be a practical how. There's great books out there on five-fold ministry that are very inspiring and theologically much deeper or broader than mine, um, I purpose to write a practical, practical handbook packed with 25 exercises to equip and activate the body of Christ uh, in all areas so that the fullness of Christ could be seen 
Yeah, I like that you you say it's a manual about uh, learning by doing. What do you mean by that? I think you unpacked that a little bit. Talk more mm-hmm. about that this is a manual learning by doing. Good, yes. Um, it's my passion to, to learn by doing, um, experiential learning. And, and really, that's the way that we learn best as humans. I mean, if you think about uh, when we're kids um, or our kids, if you have kids listening, um, in order to teach them to ride a bike, you don't give them a book to ride Mm -hmm. a bike or instructions, you just help them learn to ride a bike by doing. Or if you just take sports in general, as an example, let's say basketball. If you wanna try to play basketball and figure out what position you're good at, you try different positions. You try point guard, shooting guard, center, and you see which one you're good at. So you learn by doing. Learn the sport of basketball by doing and which position you're good at. Or take another common example, music. When you're growing up, maybe you try different instruments. You try out guitar. You try out piano. You learn which one you're good at by doing. And you learn music in general by playing. Of course, there is a theoretical basis you need to know. You need to know to read music. But you learn by doing, by trying out the different instruments. And in general, as humans, that's how we learn best. And that should include our spirituality, how we learn by doing to discover our spiritual gifts. Kind of sounds like Jesus and the 12, yeah? (laughs) He wanted them to walk with him and they learned by watching him and doing with him. So I love that. Well said. Yeah, it was life on life with Jesus. He, He would do stuff with them and experience things with them. And then they would talk, they would debrief or he would have a teaching moment. And it's learning by doing. Chris, jump in with the preface. Well, yeah, in the introduction of your book, something that caught my attention, I underlined it. You say, and you you addressed this a bit ago, when we serve others in love, our spiritual heart is pumping and we feel fulfilled. When we use gifts God has given us, we come alive. When we exercise, exercise our faith, our spiritual muscles are stimulated to growth. And when believers do this together as church, Jesus rejoices that his body is coming more and more alive in this world. So just that alone, makes me want to read more of the book because you make it practical then, as you say. Yeah. So that, that really, that, that gets my attention quickly. But when we serve others in love, our spiritual heart gets pumped. It's not, as you talk about, it's not just giving information. It's getting involved in people's lives. So anyway. Yeah. Which leads me, I love in chapter one, you talked about more than information, not more Mm -hmm. information. So Mm -hmm. unpack that a little, because people haven't read the book. They're going to after this, but talk about what you meant by that. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, more than information, not more information. I wanted to hit on the the fact that we are all overloaded with information Mm. in this day and age. It's just, you know, from the internet and from advertising and from different social media channels, we're just bombarded with messages daily and um, information and we can't even we can't even absorb it all there's not enough time or capacity in our minds or souls to be able to absorb it all so the best that we do is we bookmark a website or we save something to the cloud or we we file it away in essence but we can't absorb it because it's coming too quickly it's like drinking from a fire hose And so we know that that's not the right way to go about things, especially not in our mentoring or our discipleship. We don't want to just overload with people with information. I know you guys are very much about transformation and transferring information to people with the hopes that it transforms their lives. I give the example in the book is like it it is akin to providing someone with a book of information on how to win the Tour de France. And then expecting them to be a world-class cyclist and go out and win the Tour de France. Now, providing them with information is not going to be the solution to help them become a world-class cyclist. Uh, You need to come Mm -hmm. alongside them, teach them how to ride, teach them how to train, nutrition. There's a lot of different areas involved. But the idea is we don't want to just give people more information. We want more than information. We want practical application and we want life on life, walking alongside people to be able to help them grow in their spiritual walk as well as other areas of their lives because it's all connected, right? When you talked about over-information, we just recently recorded a podcast talking about change. And one of the roadblocks to change that we've seen over 30 plus years working with people is over-information. People gather all this Hmm. information because they want to change. And then they're so overloaded, there is no change because they get overwhelmed. So I like what you said about that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so helpful to give people, I think, small practical steps when they're overwhelmed, overloaded. It's just helpful. Okay, what's that next small step that you can take towards change? Because uh, often change is scary too, right? Change is, is uncomfortable for most people. Uh, some people thrive on change, but for most people, it's scary. And also the transformation or, or change process is scary. To be able to give them a simple practical next step or next steps uh, is very helpful. And then they're not so overloaded. Nate, where do you, what would you say? Or Okay, you talked about why you wrote the book, but what what was the turning point for you where you wanted to put it in practical terms? Mm. Like what was missing? Was something missing for you? Yeah. Did you grow up this way? It was. You, you know, I didn't tell you to say that, but that's a great lead. That's a great lead in question. You must be a podcast interviewer, Chris. You ask well, good questions. Continue, continuing to learn. We talk about earlier learning to ride a bike. We put off having a podcast too long because we, I was looking at information and you'd have to have this and this and this. And I thought, I don't know if I can do all that. And we finally said, let's hook up mm -hmm. a, a, a microphone to a laptop. And just mm -hmm. start talking. And that's how this has come about. It gets, it develops more, but I, I had too much information about creating a podcast and therefore it kept me from even doing it. Mm. Anyway, go back to that yeah. question if you would. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the why, why I wrote this, there was something missing. There was uh, over the years, a, a holy discontent that grew in me of how we do church, at least in the Western world. I grew up in church, um, in different denominations all my life. And so I've seen a decent amount of the spectrum of the body of Christ. I mean, growing up in the United States, born and raised in Springfield, Illinois, but then moved out to California and San Diego to for college. But I've traveled to 35 countries and I've been to a lot of churches in those countries. So I have a pretty decent, I would say, view of what Western Christianity looks like in terms of how we do church. And so there was a holy discontent there of how we do church and, and a desire to activate the whole body of Christ. So primarily in Western churches, we see shepherds and teachers. Shepherd would be a pastor, at least what we term a pastor in most Western churches. And most pastors or, or teachers are very active, and that's kind of the forefront of the ministry. But as we see in Ephesians 4.11, there's actually five that Jesus says he gave to his body. And we want our churches to look like Jesus, right? If the church is Jesus's body, he's the head. We want our churches to look like him. But that's only two out of the five shepherds and teachers. And he says he gave five. So if you do the math, there's a lot, there's a lot missing there. There's a big chunk missing there. Um, and I just a couple simple analogies. We're sitting in front of our laptops here. If you try typing with two fingers instead of five, or if you're typing with two hands, which most people are, four fingers out of 10, your typing is going to be really slow. And it's going to be ineffective. Think of basketball. Try playing a five-on-five -five basketball game with only two active members on your team. The other three you put on the bench. Mm. What's going to happen? Would you win? No way. Now think about your body. A third analogy, nutrition. Uh, you need different uh, nutrition, balanced nutrition to function healthily. Try ingesting only two food groups for several years. What's going to happen? Long-term, your body is going to be malnourished. Your systems are going to break down. So we're operating in the body of Christ with only two out of five systems or two players or two fingers typing. And that's not enough. And that's sad. And that's under um, representing Jesus in the end, because these five represent Jesus. And I would say that's our, our, our goal. So uh, coming full circle, there was a, a holy discontent of how we do church. And also a holy discontent for the practical aspect of not just giving people information, but wanting to give them practical uh, steps and practical ways to discover and grow in these five. I think uh, many times people feel intimidated. They feel not worthy. They feel uneducated in order to fulfill roles, vital roles mm -hmm. in the church. And I want to give a, 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 an example. You mentioned the basketball. When I was in the fifth grade, it was my first year to ever try basketball, and I went to a small school, and so fifth graders through eighth graders were on the same team. So you had to compete mm -hmm. against wow. these older guys. Well, no one had ever worked with me on basketball, but I wanted to play it. 
So we yeah. had this uh, this game, and of course, I sat on the bench most of the time. Oh. And there was this one game, and uh, you know, a huge what looked like huge gymnasium, and everyone on our team fouled out except two of us. Well, the two of us were sitting on the bench. That's how we didn't foul out. So uh, <laughs> we still had a we still had a quarter of the game to go, <laughs> and so the coach. Oh. The coaches from both teams talked, and then they, no one else, they sent three of the guys down on the other team. And it was two on two for a quarter of the oh game. Oh, my gosh. No Which no was way. <laughs> embarrassing and also kind of cool, too. But yeah, yeah. I, I did not have the skills to play effectively. Uh, obviously, we got beat. But the, 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 the court itself was so huge just for four players. It was overwhelming. And then yeah. you knew you had all the audience looking at looking at you. You made me just think of this. I was not given tools. I was not equipped to do to handle that well at all. Yeah. And but wow. if I had three other guys out there with some with some training, with some practical learning and advice, it would have gone a lot better. Mm. It was overwhelming just with two of us. Yeah, yeah. I would think but that you've lived it. You've lived it, Chris. <laughs> I lived it. Yeah, I was. I thought it was. This is cool, but really embarrassing. There's only because yeah. I was. I was really shy at the time, anyway. And so you've got two on two. Yeah, wasn't a good. Wasn't a good experience. Well, I don't think that's a too big of a jump to. That could be how a lot of pastors in the Western Church feel. They're playing two on two mm-hmm. when, like, where's the help? I want to go back to what you said about your holy discontent, and you you kept mm-hmm. saying with the church, not with God. Mm. And I I love in this age of deconstruction and all of that, that your, your discontent was not with God, but with the church. Mm -hmm. And so the discontent unpack that, what were you discontent with? Because a lot of people are going, Oh, I think I am content until maybe they go, wait, but what is the church supposed to look like? Yeah, that is a big question, Christina. And we would have to take lots of podcasts to unpack that and multiple books have been written on this topic. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story that I tell in the book that several years ago, I was hosting a, a missions team here in Vienna, Austria, and they were from Canada. And we went to the center of the city where there's a huge cathedral. And in this cathedral, at this cathedral, there's a lot of men and women selling tickets for concerts. They're dressed up like Mozart, Vienna, of course, known for classical music, one of the capital cities of classical music in the world. And he was selling tickets for one concert in a palace. And we were just talking to them. And uh, he said he's from Kosovo. I shared I've been to Kosovo several times. He was really touched and amazed that anyone had been to his country, Mm. but that I was doing some youth work there. And he gave me two free tickets, like 69 euro tickets, class A category. And I didn't believe it. I thought they were either fake tickets or he was just messing with me or I, I don't know. But, you know, a couple of weeks later, I went to the concert and they were valid tickets. And I found myself inside this 17th century palace, Schönbrunn, for those of you who are familiar with the city of Vienna. And there was this 16 member orchestra playing and it was incredible. It was beautiful. And there's stucco art on on the wall. It's just an incredible atmosphere listening to this classical music. And as I was sitting there, the Lord began to speak to me as I I was kind of zoning in on this violinist, the top violinist who was then playing a solo. The music was so sharp and crisp and beautiful, but I sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to me and saying, this is how we do church. And I didn't really know what that meant at the moment, but it was like the the top player, the pastor, for example, who's a professional, plays the instrument beautifully, and everyone sits in the seats and the rows and is just in awe and says, wow, look how good they are. They are really, really good. And there's one active person and a lot of passive people watching this incredible performance. And they're inspired and they're um, in awe or, or maybe even like, wow, I could never play an instrument like that or preach a sermon like that. Or So imagine then the violinist in the middle of the concert hands you the violin to play. Wow, you're going to be in shock. You, you don't know how to hold the violin. You don't know how to read the music. You don't know how to play it. You've never been equipped. You've never been taught how to play the violin and you don't know how to definitely don't have not only know how to play the violin, but you don't know how to play together with others in the orchestra. So 
I believe what's needed is for that top player to come alongside and show the person how to play. And that's a discipleship uh, coming alongside to show the practical how to mentor, to walk alongside life on life, like you shared earlier with Jesus's example. And I wanted, so there was the, that, that holy discontent with um, a few select people, uh, kind of the professionals doing the ministry, and then a lot of passive individuals observing. Now, my desire and hope is that the whole body of Christ can be activated. And that's that was a large part of the, the holy discontent. And also moving from a kind of a twofold pastor teacher to a fivefold expression of Christ. Yeah, I love when I read that story, I went, ah, because I think my holy discontent, that story sums it all up. Yeah, I love mm. that. I should have said this at the get-go, but we envision ourselves doing this with you to unpack the whole book. The rest of the chapters today was just, what is the fivefold? Who are you? Um, mm. Is there anything to set up this first initial podcast for what will then follow is there anything else that you want to add to what we've already talked about to kind of set up or define the premise of the book? That's a great question as well. Yeah, to create a frame um, for where we are and where we're going. Uh, I think you introduced it well, in essence. Where does this concept come from? It comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, um, in context, verses 1 through 16. Specifically, verse 11 is names these five but this theme is, is actually traced throughout the entire Bible. So if you zoom out big picture to get kind of a framework for this, these things are rooted in who God is. So God ex expresses these five different characteristics in his nature of who he is. So these are theologically rooted in who God is. Now, Jesus is the full expression of God. And so they are also fully expressed in the ministry of Jesus. And we can see specific examples throughout the New Testament of Jesus exemplifying these ministries. So everyone would agree Jesus was a good shepherd, right? Everyone would say, yes, Jesus was a good shepherd. In Mark 122, he's, he's a teacher with unrivaled authority. People would say, yes, Jesus was an amazing teacher. A lot of people who are not even believers in Jesus would agree Jesus was an amazing teacher. And not so well known would be those other three. but most people would also agree Jesus was an incredible evangelist, right? He shared and proclaimed the good news. In fact, Mark 1.15, he, he stands in front of people. He said, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. Literally, I'm embodying the kingdom of God and good news is here. I've arrived and I'm bringing in a new kingdom and I'm proclaiming this message of the kingdom. So King Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom. That's evangelism and evangelist Jesus. So he embodied the teacher, the shepherd, the evangelist. And then those last two, those are a little bit more tricky for us, especially in the Western world. Sometimes those words have baggage or, or, or are misunderstood or maybe even abused, unfortunately, but they are biblical. They're very biblical and they can be traced throughout the whole Bible. So Jesus being a prophet means uh, he, was, he was acknowledged as a prophet, uh, someone who spoke for God. And of course, we have lots of examples of Old Testament prophets specifically named and then in the New Testament, we have uh, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us, a new covenant where Jesus has given us his spirit to be able to speak, to be able to connect with God and speak out words of edification, comfort, strengthening, which is 1 Corinthians 14, 3, the basis of prophecy. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that Jesus embodied all five of these. And last but not least, just so that we have the full picture, as an apostle, he was recognized, Hebrews 3.1 says he is an apostle. Jesus was an apostle. Apostle just means a sent one. It's just a Greek word that means a sent one with a task. In Latin, it's translated into missio, which is where we get our English and German words of mission. So if you're sent on a mission, it's like the idea of an ambassador. So Jesus was sent by God to start with a task to start the kingdom of God. And um, then he says in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent, me, so I am sending you. And if we're honest, guys, Jesus sends us all, right? He sends us all to be uh, on mission where we work, where we live, where we play. Uh, we're all called to live on mission. Uh, but to create a frame for where we're going, uh, it, it begins with God, rooted in God theologically, his nature, his character, given to Jesus. 
um, or embodied in Jesus perfectly, and he's our role model for all the five. And then he, Jesus says in Ephesians 4 that he gives them, as part of the resurrection cycle, part of the ascension, he says he gives these gifts to his body. He's going away, so he wants us to extend his ministry, to continue his ministry through him, the church, worldwide church. And these are expressed then uh, in individuals, you and me, normal people doing normal things, or hopefully all doing extraordinary things, but we're given these gifts to live them out in the world. And that's the, the kind of the big picture framework of this. And it's exciting. Our pulse comes alive and it's exciting to discover uh, where we may be primarily gifted in and how we can serve others in love through that. I love this. Yeah. As, uh, people could be wondering, okay, now why are you talking about this on this Real Life Mentoring podcast? And I'll go back to our foundation that we, as we mm-hmm. mentor people, that we, it's holistic, that we are spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, relational, professional, vocational, I would say, mm-hmm. all of those mm-hmm. impact one another. And so today, guys, we want you to understand, we want to help you to be developed spiritually mm-hmm. in, in your relationship with God, in your relationship with Christ. And so it's it's a vital, it's the foundation of what we talk about, what we do. It, impact, it impacts everything else in your life. And so we want to do, we do want to give you practical tools. We have a good friend who's the guy to go to for nutrition. So I want to go to him and say, hey, what should I do about mm-hmm. this? And he can tell me. Yeah. And so this is uh, this is helping people understand. We want to help you grow spiritually, where it's not a religion for you. It's not going to church. It's your relationship with God. God using you, your gifts, your talents to impact other people deeply, but not by giving them from information, but by the relationships you would develop. Is that fair to say? Yeah. As we wrap up, Nate, why don't you tell people, we're going to include it. It'll be in the the written transcript, Mm -hmm. but tell people how they can get a copy of the book or join your email list. Thanks. And and let me just jump back to go off of what Chris said, because I do want to make that connection uh, for those listening, uh, whether you're listening to this podcast while cooking or running or in the background while you're working, this has incredible implications for vocation because um, vocation is, is is your calling your job what you're doing for a living and yeah, if you can absolutely. and and these gifts are are part of our identity in Christ so you are the gift if that makes sense rather than a gift of like something that you possess but you are the gift which means wherever you go you're representing this gift so that goes beyond this is my point the four walls of a church or it goes beyond right. a sunday church service into your workplace mm. and into your family and into your neighborhood everywhere where you work live and play this has implications for your vocation and in terms of mentoring others if you are someone who mentors others you know people are incredibly complex um, and it's sometimes challenging to mentor others but if you can understand where someone is gifted in primarily in one of these five, it gives a huge jump start to mentor them because you can really understand who someone is. If I understand that Chris, for example, is a pioneer and visionary, that would be uh, categorized as apostolic. then I have a huge framework for understanding where his strengths are, where his weaknesses are, and how I can guide him to a more flourishing life as, as a mentor. So I just wanted to make that connection as well. As you said, much this so. is yeah, that's what the podcast is about, real life mentoring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that yeah, sounds good. That's excellent. Tell us how people can order your book or join your email list. Yeah, wasn't trying to avoid the question. I appreciate the question. <laughs> um, no, I'm glad you did. There's a, so I have a website uh, that has uh, where you can order the book directly, um, fivefoldtraining.com. It might pop up in German, then you can just switch it to English as I'm located in Vienna, Austria, fivefoldtraining.com. And then on the menu, you just click on book. You can order a copy or copies there. And there's also some free resources on there, previous podcast interviews or videos or articles, things where you can grow and learn on your own as well, some free resources. And would love if you join an email list for further learning, inspiration, and training. They'll provide a link, I think, in the footer of the podcast. So. Not my goal is not to spam you, but only to provide good con- content information that leads to further learning, leads to inspiration, leads to training opportunities as well. You can feel free to subscribe at any time 
for Fivefold Training, inspiration and impact. Yeah, well, for those who have listened, uh, you know that we partner with people who are like-minded, and that's why we were so excited to have you on the podcast to give information specifically in this area. And then we're all about giving people resources. And so we totally support, check out his, his website, subscribe to the email because we are so passionate, obviously, about what Nate is putting out in the area of fivefold ministry. And you will be blessed by, by getting in any information. Sorry, tongue tied there. (laughs) Anything else you want to close? No, it's been great. Thank you, Nate. Yeah. So stay tuned for more episodes as we discuss the other contents of the book. Check out Nate's website. It'll be in the subscription or transcription, whatever it's called, of the podcast. And Nate, thank you so much for giving your time to us. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Yeah, this was fun. Thanks for having me on, guys. We want to thank you as always for listening. If today was helpful, if something that you listened to was helpful, we would really love it if you would go to Apple or Spotify, leave us a review, download, subscribe, and for all things related to podcast, if you'd like to give a financial contribution to help us continuing bringing this sort of broadcasting to you, just go to FahrenheitMentoring.org. Hi, this is Chris Corral, producer of the Fahrenheit Real Life Mentoring Podcast. This podcast is produced through a partnership with the Confetti Corral Boutique and Michelle Corral Realtor. To find out more about these businesses who support our vision and ministry, go to confetticorral.com or find them on Facebook.